On February 25th, Brazil became the first country in South America to report a COVID-19 infection. And as the number of cases increased over the subsequent weeks and months, its president refused to take any strong measures. He fought with state leaders who imposed lockdowns and mandated social distancing rules, calling their actions economically ruinous. Jair Bolsonaro still refuses to acknowledge the seriousness of the global pandemic. He's called the virus nothing more than a little flu. His priority has been to keep the economy going at any cost. But now Brazil has recorded more than one million infections and the world's second highest death toll. And as Bolsonaro pushes for people to go back to work, two of his health ministers have walked away. Nelson Teich had taken office on April 17th, but resigned just four weeks later. Teich had replaced Luis Enrique Mandetta, whom Bolsonaro had dismissed for supporting quarantines. The president called it a consensual divorce, but Mandetta's sacking caused anger across Brazil with many banging pots and pans from their windows. So how will President Bolsonaro's handling of this pandemic affect the more than 200 million Brazilians? And are his decisions influenced by his friendship with the US president? We'll put those questions to one of the men who's played a central role during this crisis. Brazil's former health minister, Luis Enrique Mandetta, talks to Al Jazeera. Luis Enrique Mandetta, thank you for being with us. You have said that a doctor never abandons his patient. So assuming that Brazil is the patient, how would you describe its condition right now? Well, this patient called Brazil is a patient that I had the pleasure and honor to take care of him during the first 90 days of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. As far as we were in charge, we were putting the system to go larger and larger so that we could uh, check our people and uh, guarantee that they would have a room to fight for life. And I think that the measures that we did in the beginning till the time that we were there, I still the ones that are keeping this system alive, although the patient is uh, uh, suffering from transparency on its numbers and how the press can make the cover of the numbers and and really inform the people. So I think that we are in the middle of the pandemic season. We have a country that is a really a continent and we have some cities that are really went through the problem. One's in the middle time and other ones that didn't start yet. So I think that we'll go till September uh, struggling with that. So from what you're saying, it sounds like the, the number of cases, which is already incredibly large, uh, is even bigger than what is being reported. Is that, is that correct? Well, I, I think that the number of cases are smaller than they are because we didn't have the chance to have the enough tests to check the whole population as, as we uh, should have done because the first world countries like the United States and Europe, they really went into the market in the beginning and they bought everything. And we didn't have anybody to really make a difference on uh, uh, putting some tests equally for the different countries. So I think that we have more cases, but the number of deaths, this is more possible than real. So I think that we are coming to a million cases tested on PCRT and we have something around 45,000 deaths. For a country of this size, uh, with this population, with 215 million people, when you put this uh, in an average and compare with countries of our size, we are in the midterm countries. Uh, our health system really worked well. Here in Sao Paulo, we opened 7,500 intensive care units. So the system really responded uh, well, our industry became to producing uh, all the equipment that we need. So we are now becoming to a, a time that we really can produce everything we need to face the epidemic. So it's not easy, but we are struggling very hard to, to, to give people a chance for fighting for life. Is this because of 
or despite President Jair Bolsonaro? I think that despite President Bolsonaro, because he's been, uh, he made a choice, and, and it's a false dilemma, of thinking that the economy should reopen and that we should never have make any kind of isolation, any kind of stay home like uh, uh, a policy. So uh, the population really, the people uh, took care as far as they could. Some really did not. He puts pressure for uh, soccer to, to come back. He puts pressure for the companies to reopen since the beginning. So despite of the, the way that he thought that we should do, We've been trying to speak very in a very uh, easy way. The press is free. The Supreme Court had to work uh, for our Minister of Health to release the numbers in the right way. There's a lot. The press made a, a, a kind of arrangement that they have every day the numbers that are collected by the states and cities and are sent to the press to try to make the, the, the civil society is really participating on it. So despite uh, his positions, we are, we, are, we are really trying to make our best. Well, the president accused you, first of all, of spreading panic throughout Brazil. You said you were a very good communicator, you spread panic. And he also says that you manipulated and exaggerated the figures of the number of, people, of the people who were infected by COVID-19. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I really didn't think that it was necessary to respond. I think that it's so, so small uh, in front of the cases of all the victims that are and the numbers that are all around. Uh, I'm not a communicator. I mean, if you see the images, you saw Italy, you saw the health system falling apart in New York, you saw the nurses in England working with uh, plastic bags in their heads because they didn't have the equipment. Um, I mean, it's, it's just someone uh, trying to say something to try to, to put a political blame on somebody else. First, he tried to blame it on China. Then people said, oh, China is paying for the whole business around here. You shall not do it. So the China, Chinese ambassador really complained. So he stopped complaining on China. Then he complained and put the blame on the... World Health Organization. And they said, well, you, that's the diplomacy for health. You buy some medicines uh, very well from the World Health Organization. Brazil is one of the proponents of its uh, creation years ago. So he stopped on this. It was too far. So then he decided to blame it on me. It's okay to blame it on me as long as he doesn't make any more damage in the president. It's okay to blame it on me. I don't care. I did what I thought that my my, my values were supposed to be done, how I was taught by my, uh, the people that I worked with. We, we only said the truth. The numbers were there to everybody for the free society. And uh, it was it. It's, uh, it's a shame, but it's, uh, uh, history will, will tell. You mentioned the uh, WHO. President Bolsonaro wants to remove Brazil from the WHO. And so I wonder, you who worked with him so closely, how much of his decisions do you think are influenced by his friend, uh, President Donald Trump of the United States? Yeah, I think that it's very, they're very close and they try to to follow one to, uh, Bolsonaro follows Trump uh, and it was automatic. Right in the next week that Trump said that, he started saying the same thing here. I don't think that he really thinks on doing that. Neither Trump thinks on doing that. Because, you know, you, you cannot be an island. The world will have to discuss uh, new tools for the World Health Organization, uh, remodel it, modernize it. But the countries that, if the countries are not sit on the same table to make this discussion, the ones that are not sit there will not be able to argue. Uh, so Brazil is, doesn't have the size of the United States to say that it's going to leave the World Health Organization and really do it. So I think it was just, you know, uh, just just a political talk. So you don't think that they're going to go through with it? No, they will not. They will not. Uh, Trump has an election in the second semester. Uh, Bolsonaro has in 2022. So as soon as Trump passes through his election, no matter the result, if he loses, 
the uh, United States won't do it. If he wins, the United States won't do it. So Bolsonaro is probably going to change his position also. You know, I found it was very interesting when you, in your farewell letter after you were sacked by President Bolsonaro, you described him as extremely humanist. And I was wondering why you used that term to describe him, considering that the president, in your own words, prioritized, gave more priority, more importance to the economy than to saving perhaps the lives of his uh, of other Brazilians. Well, there are so many things that I, I, I had to find ways to say and this, uh, calling him a humanist, if you read the Camus with his famous book, A Peste, I don't know how it's said in English, but... The Plague, the, the plague. plague. You will see a time in the book where they say that the humanists always believe that the human is our superior, that they are really gonna win by the end. So it was, uh, if you read The Plague, you understand why I call him a humanist. It was not uh, as uh, uh, a good uh, a good way of being someone in this, this the middle of a plague. Mm, not as a compliment, you mean? Not as a compliment. No, no, not at all. Well, now that you say this, you know, in Brazil, uh, many like to say, and certainly President Bolsonaro says it often. He says that God is Brazilian and that the cure is right here, and that brings up the whole issue of science versus religion. And that's a problem, uh, that's an issue not just in Brazil, but all over the world, especially in times of a pandemic. How do you convince people and governments that uh, science is more relevant than religion in certain cases? Well, saying the truth, uh, if you say the truth and you search the truth, when I was there, I was speaking to Brazilian people almost every day or three or four times a week. And we put the numbers, we put the things that we didn't know, we put the things that we thought that we know that, that were true, that became not true anymore. So really explaining them that science is the only way to do it. Well, we had three pillars. Uh, the health system, the Brazilian health system, that's called SUS, is one of our pillars to defend it. The second pillar was life. And to say that every life matters, no matter uh, if rich or poor, if black or white. And third, science as the way to take decisions. And that really brought the people together. When he started saying all that chloroquine, all that kind of uh, things, saying that God, Brazilia, and that the Brazilians are, we go well with this disease because we are different people. Uh, the, if you see the polls here, 84% of people believe in science and believe in what we were saying, and he uh, didn't believe on what he was saying. So I think it's just a matter of time and things will go each one to the, 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 the right place. And I think that science will prevail. Well, maybe so, but right now hydroxychloroquine is on the protocol for all Brazilians who go to public hospitals with COVID-19. In a country as large as Brazil, uh, how, cons how much of a concern is that? I think it's a big concern because we don't know, first, we don't know if it works. And the second is that we don't know if it harms people. Uh, I think that the Lancet and the World Health Organization made a mess with that paper that they they released the paper and one week later then they took the paper off because they didn't take the right measures to publish it. So now they're, we're going to have to wait. But as soon as you come to a paper that really uh, shows that it has no benefit, and what I'm worried is that if it shows that it harms, that it brings more problems than solution, if it uh, people die from a uh, stroke or heart attack, I think that we're going to have many, many people suing the government for doing that. So I think that science is the one that's going to answer this question by the end. And that's just, as I say, many leaders uh, decided to face this disease in a political way. And they all started the same way. This happened to Boris Johnson in England, to Trump in the United States, to the guy in Mexico, to Bolsonaro. The problem is that everybody, when faced the problem and really saw people dying in their countries, they decided to change their position. 
And this is not wrong. They started in a certain way and they faced the truth and they called for science. They called for people to preserve lives, what would be the most, the, the largest value uh, of some countries. And Bolsonaro kept on it and didn't change his position. That's why it brings the whole world amazed to what he's doing. Exactly. But, you know, some people, one explanation perhaps for what many of us might see as a somewhat uh, irrational decisions is that that sort of human tendency to go into denial when faced with fear. And in fact, I think you said, and I'm quoting you, I think you called it the rejection of facts that is magnified by hatred. And I'm wondering how does hatred uh, fit into the equation in this case? Well, it fits uh, because of the social media. That's where they get the crowd to say that he's right. And people that talk so are only for that kind of people that really follows the social media. And they are really, they are really, uh, um, if he says that they should pray, they will pray. If they say the nation is left, they will laugh. So he thinks that that's, that's a political power. So the hatred comes from there. I think that they, this, the same people that is applauding is the people that is going to throw stones on him. Well, right now, President Bolsonaro is saying that the military of Brazil, the armed forces, would not allow an elected president to be removed from office. Many people, in fact, are already saying that the military is in charge of the government, including uh, hundreds of people who are now sitting inside the health ministry, and that it also includes, by the way, the acting health minister, who is a, a retired army officer. Does that worry you? Well, he's not a retired. He's uh, he's in charge here. Yeah. He's he's um, he was in charge of the whole Amazon area. He just uh, left there to run the Minister of Health, which I think that it's not. Uh, it, it's it's it's. It's a, it's a pity because we have so many sharp and brilliant people on health to work there. Um, I don't think that the military forces uh, would do anything for him if he really has some kind of guilty that brings it to, to some kind of uh, impeachment or so. But what I think is that he uses as a political weapon, but I think that when things comes to a point the democratic institutions in Brazil are very strong, and if it, something happens, uh, we did that with Miss Dilma, we did that with people on the streets, with color. Uh, I think that the institutions here are pretty well, and the democratic system is very strong here. There will be no way to, to walk uh, a single line out of it. In hindsight, and in view of this pandemic, do you regret having ended a cooperation agreement with Cuba that sent back thousands of Cuban doctors and nurses to their country? No, I don't think so. They, they were only, by the time that they ended that program in 2018, there were 8,000 8, physicians. Uh, Brazil has something around 540,000. So it was nothing uh, close to what we have. And they were really replaced very fast. Um, that program really was a problem for the physicians from Cuba that came over. Almost 3,000 of them decided to stay here because they didn't have any freedom in Cuba. Uh, they were not allowed to have families and they got married here, they have kids. They are not allowed now to work because they would have to take tests to, to, to be recognized as physicians. Um, that, that program really had some very deep, deep problems with it that I think it was better to, to stop. And the Brazilian physicians really are taking care of it. Okay, now, well, you are, you are writing a book right now and um, about your time in the health ministry. What will your book reveal or tell us that we don't know at this point? <laughs> the first reason I decided to write is because the last time that we had uh, a situation like this in Brazil was 1917 in the Spanish flu. Um, and we don't have many things written from that period of time. And I thought, can you imagine if something like this happens a hundred years from now and people would say, what were the big, the big uh, discussion that they were having 
how the health system worked by that time, what decisions did they take. Uh, there were so many things that we did that I decided to put it on the book. And you know, when you write a book, uh, you, you have to write how were you surrounded by the power of the presidency and how the other ministers helped, uh, how the press worked. Uh, so people have a lot of curiosity of how things worked. So I think that the book will have um, two, two, two good points. The first one is to, to become a document from this time, the numbers, how, the, how, how we saw from the Brazilian perspective, the world, uh, dealing with the disease and how things worked inside, inside the, the power, inside the government here. And the way they work inside the government, if you had to give it a grade, what would you give it? Well, I'm not a teacher to give grades, but <laughs> I know that you want to do this question. But I would say that uh, there was a, a pretty good part of the government that really uh, worked hard to help. And there was a part that was really a lousy. So I would say 50% good, 50 well, from zero to 10, I would give a five to the government. But some people had a grade 10, and some people had a grade zero. So individually, you have some people that really brought this average down. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, you know, you have, when you left uh, the ministry, your popularity was something like 76%, even higher than the now ex justice, former justice minister, Sergio Moro. I'm just wondering, since uh, you are a politician as well as a doctor, would you perhaps be considering running for president? It's, it's so far, it's in uh, 2022 that we're going to have elections here. Uh, Mr. Moore is a close friend of mine. Uh, we've been chatting, we've been talking, and who knows what is going to happen in years to come. But I'm sure that I'm going to participate in the next elections as a citizen, um, saying everything that I always said, talking to people, but I really cannot imagine how things are going to be till then. I just hope that I have Brazil will be in a better shape, in a good health, uh, so that we can have a democratic elections, make a very good discussion about things that we really need to work here. Nobody can stand anymore. Uh, this, uh, in one side, the extreme left wing, like PT and all the problems that they had in government. On the other hand, the extreme right and Bolsonaro and all the problems that they have. People are tired and sick of this kind of uh, duality. So I think that there's a room for the middle, for no polarization, for people that really wanted to take care and make a serious job. I hope that I can be in this field. Perhaps even as the president. Who knows? I'm more than 35 years old and I'm born in Brazil. So there are only the two conditions that, that uh, you have to be to run for president. So I'm 55. I'm a grandfather of Gabriel. I have a wonderful family. I have a very good, a very nice, and I love my, my profession uh, as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I really like to, to run health systems, run health hospital systems, so I can really help my country in many, many ways. I had uh, invitations to stay in the United States when I was a fellow there, to work in other countries all around the world but I always decided to come back here because I, I know that here you have so many work to be done. And my generation is now coming to a time that they would have to say what they think about the country. Luis Enrique Mandetta, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. I thank you very much for inviting me.